Hello friends, this is Aunt. at least if you use your wildest imagination, and I have to say that I am enjoying Dead by Daylight despite my prior expectations. Dead by Daylight, the game that has miraculously survived for seven years while having Behavior Interactive as its developer. I initially started playing this game around five years ago, when the Spirit was the most recently released killer for the game, and it was because I had friends that also really enjoyed the title. I put around 60 hours into the game until I decided that I had had enough with it in December of 2019 and left a pretty scathing review for it afterwards. My opinions remain that way until my cousin, who has around 3,000 hours in the game by now, said that I should give it another shot. And so I dropped some cash into the Killer and Survivor expansion packs, and for the past month or so now I've been intermittently playing the game and watching as much content as possible to absorb knowledge on it as well. I'd say that I've been enjoying my time so far, mostly because there's a lot of depth to the game that I initially gave it credit for. And sure, the play pattern of both Survivor and Killer is fairly linear in nature, but it's that low skill floor, high skill ceiling kind of gameplay that plays perfectly into DBD's unique gameplay formula. Repairing generators and escaping the trial grounds versus doing whatever you can in your power to make sure that doesn't happen is what you need to do upon opening the game, but understanding how to use perks, pop or pallet looping, using items effectively, and playing with or against the killer's power properly, those are the mechanics that, by getting a solid grasp on the minutia, can make all the difference between a victory and a defeat. There's something immensely satisfying in being able to master such simple mechanics and see clear binary results for it, and that's where a lot of my recent enjoyment for DVD has come from. The asymmetrical nature of DVD does muddy the definition of what a victory or defeat actually means, and I think that accepting a few losses, especially for how truly new I am to the game, is vital to my continued enjoyment of the title. It might be the same for other people too, where losing a survivor or two to the killer themselves, or for the killer to lose them through the exegates is you know, not a massive problem. I don't know, the game itself has a ranking system and an ostentatiously awful MMR system that's so laughably bad that in my eyes it actually doesn't matter. And this is coming from the perspective of someone who's played a lot of League of Legends and Valorant and Rainbow Six Siege where MMR and rankings and then casual game modes are all made separate because when you go into a ranked mode, that's when you want to try and prove yourself. But if you always have to play ranked mode, then the ranked mode becomes the new casual because players of all skill levels are allowed to be in this pot of players you can play with or against. Yeah, there, like there is no way to play a casual game mode because every game puts you on the ranking ladder, meaning that every match has next to nothing to play for aside from personal improvement and a desire to learn more about the game. The fact that there are so many killers in the game now, and so many survivors to pick from does make each match a unique puzzle to play around. You know, add the different layouts of the variety of maps into the mix, and you have a recipe for a pretty diverse game. Now, watching experienced streamers, and thanks to the streams of Otofu, competitive players play this game at a high level is gratifying as a spectator at a multitude of skill levels, because even someone such as myself can understand what every action means. The content creators at the upper echelon of DBD content also seem to be extremely chill, which is a rarity considering some of the other streamers I know from my League of Legends days. From what I can tell, the most popular Dead by Daylight streamer and content creator is Altstarva, and he does have his moments where he yells into the camera, he'll react negatively or loudly to something that happened in the game that he's frustrated with, but for the most part a lot of his streams are very chill and he's super kind to people who are in the post-game chat and all of that sort of thing. And you compare, you know, Altstarva being the, the pinnacle of Dead by Daylight content, and you compare that to League of Legends, where League of Legends we have Tyler1, you know, we, we have Kesha, we have... <laughs> <laughs> like, all these people who are well known for being very loud and brash and, and obnoxious. I think even with Rainbow Six Siege, the most popular content creator in Rainbow Six Siege right now is Jinxie. And full disclosure, I don't like Jinxie. I don't enjoy that kind of personality where his entire... The, the main appeal for him seems to be he's a good player that is also loud and and says funny things or has like funny facial expressions that people find interesting. I, that's what I see is a lot of the appeal of Jinxie. And I don't get that feeling from the top creators of Dead by Daylight. Now there might be some that are along those lines, but for the most part, because the creators are chill, the community itself 
at least within the stream, seem to be relatively chill as well. I've actively chosen to make that comparison because the worst of the community in this game, which you do run into frequently, especially if you're off of stream chats or video comments, seems to be extremely toxic and that all blossoms from the core mechanics of the game in my opinion. So let's be honest, the goal of Dead by Daylight is to be as much of an inconvenience as possible to either side. So for survivors, they have to be an inconvenience to the killer so that they complete their objective primarily by wasting time. And the killer has to disrupt the survivor's objective through whatever means necessary. And that's where a lot of the animosity seems to come from. Survivors think that killers are too powerful or, or too mean because they're trying to maximize their win conditions. And killers think survivors are actively trying to encourage as little interactivity as possible. Just, oh, you know, these survivors are gen rushing. Oh, oh, this killer is slugging me, you know, all, all that sort of thing. But neither side would exist without the other. Like, if you if you wanted to play a game where you just sit on gens and open an exit gate without the threat of there being a killer on the other side of it, then the survivor's point of view has no point to it. And the same thing goes for the killer. Like, if the killer can just walk up to and destroy every, you know, survive with friends group or, or survivor group in general, get 4Ks every single game because they're just able to walk up and kill them immediately. You might as well just go play Modern Warfare or something if you want to play a game like that. And since both sides have a really binary goal, I find the concept of toxicity in this game to be hilarious. Like, oh, I can't believe that you interrupted me from getting a kill on a survivor as if that's not your primary goal or what they're trying to avoid. It's like, oh, I can't believe you've been gen rushing when that's kind of the only thing that survivors can do to win the game, at least in, in the clearest sense. But from the way I see it, Dead by Daylight suffers from how clearly it separates solo queuing players from players that are teamed together. And it's a poor solo queue experience because the killer is there to capitalize on individual mistakes, something that's far easier to do when survivors are solo queued because they don't have the communication, they don't have the understanding of each other's perks or positioning or all of that without bringing some perks that might also dampen their ability to play the game. But it's a poor team game because a well-coordinated survivor team can easily breeze past and invalidate most of the killer roster. I'm thinking along the lines of Myers, right? I think Myers is a great example of this where he's meant to be this killer that's super stealthy, super sneaky and everything. But then if you run into a survivor team that has their heads on a swivel and they're calling out your location constantly, you're not going to get anything done with, with Myers. It's very, very difficult to do against a well-coordinated team. And that's also why in higher competitive spheres, you often see it's like blight and Nurse are your top two killers in the game. And then there's everyone else is kind of in a pool that degrades further and further the further down the ladder you go. All the way down to Trapper. I think Trapper is probably the worst killer in the game, at least from what I've uh, what I've heard and seen in the game. But that means that in order for the killer to feel like they have a better chance at increasing their kill rate, they have to hope that they queue into solo players or inexperienced comp players, while survivors are pressured to constantly stack as a team so as to mitigate those possible mistakes. And behavior themselves also seems to always nerf perks on a percentage use basis and not on the basis of why those perks are being used so often. So at the top three perks for killers are Pain Resonance, Jolt, and Pop Goes the weasel that doesn't mean that gen regression perks are strong they're necessary in order for the killer to feel like they have control over the match and if the top three perks for survivors are windows of opportunity made for this and adrenaline that doesn't mean that survivors prefer to be chased that simply means that the benefits of being chased far outweigh any other aspect of the game now in my extremely brief playtime of dead by daylight i have played more survivor than killer i have enjoyed playing the role of an altruist being a mobile heal bot is one of the funniest things things to me by running sprint burst botany knowledge will make it an empathy so if i'm ever feeling like i'll never get help in solo queue i'll try throwing on inner healing deja vu kindred and balanced landing but according to the mmr gains the only way that i will ever benefit from playing is by getting out through the exit gate so these limited perk builds that i have are nothing more than meme status by refusing to acknowledge the base state of the game that forces survivors and killers alike to play with the best of
of the best perks in order to rank up quicker, Dead by Daylight is, from my understanding, largely kept alive by releasing regular content patches. New perks and killers means new pieces of the puzzle every few months, so it feels more and more like it's a new floor being added to a skyscraper whose foundation was made on some extremely porous concrete. And I don't mean to isolate one side of the community over the other, but rather would like to point out that there is plenty of potential here, and I've had fun with what little I've been able to experience. In the short amount of time that I've had in playing both sides of the game, I feel really bad for longtime DVD fans because it's unfortunate for them to have Behavior Interactive as the lead development team. The game itself is so extremely entertaining, both to watch and play, so much so that the dedicated fans are jaded with Behavior's game design that they're willing to shrug their shoulders and keep at it anyway. And before I go any further, I'd like to apologize for coming off as negative in this video compared to the one where I talked about Fortnite. Because because this is a property that I want to see do well, and I'm equally perplexed by its continued success. As much as this title is touted as a horror game though, I do feel like most of my anxiety towards the game comes from not understanding the community's expectations, especially when I'm playing the killer side. You know, does this count as camping? How much slugging is too toxic? What if this is my second game ever as Huntress and I run into a team that actually knows what they're doing and they get salty in the post game chat at me after I lost three of them on Irie anyway, which is the True story, by the way. And I could take my own advice, but in this specific scenario, I'm uncertain of what makes me a bad player compared to an inexperienced one. To give you an idea of where my sense of trepidation comes from, Rainbow Six Siege is the game that I have the most tracked hours in, and I'm a bad Rainbow Six player because I have several ha bad habits that I've collected over time. And so in the same way, I don't want to start bad habits with this game, but it's really, really hard to gauge because of the community reaction to how I've played in the past versus not understanding what goals I should be reaching for. When most of the online discourse or information available to me is set up as an us versus them kind of scenario, it's difficult to know the ideal conditions for the game without feeling like someone has to choose a side. And it's also a damn shame that this game's most impactful content is locked behind purchasable DLC. Now keep in mind, I, I totally bought into this, wanting to play DBD to a greater potential by purchasing the Killer and Survivor expansion packs along with a couple of other chapters that aren't included with it. But in doing so, I've also missed out on some of the most powerful perks in the game currently. I don't have Gabriel Soma, so I miss out on Made for this. I don't have Xenomorph, meaning that I have zero access to Ultimate Weapon or Rapid Brutality. But because Behavior nerfs perks based on usage and kill rates, if I handed out the cash necessary to purchase these DLCs that are impactful now, there's a very real chance that they will be made obsolete in the near future, and my money will be wasted. To be clear, Dead by Daylight is not a pay to win game, strictly speaking, as it is still possible to win games with base set perks so long as the game knowledge is there. The game is displayed as a $20 purchase on Steam though, in order to get more out of the title that might get kneecapped by the nerf hammer anyway, one has to shill out an unhealthy amount of money. I understand that live service games keep up these kinds of practices in order to make sure that they can continue funding their servers and the people who work on the title. I have spent an embarrassing amount of money on Fortnite skins, League of Legends cosmetics, Legends of Runeterra battle passes, and Rainbow Six Siege. I even have a Valorant skin, my self-respect is so low. But the difference there being that these purchases have been purely cosmetic, and I haven't had to spend a dime on playing the games in the themselves. When it comes to League of Legends, all of the champions can be earned by using Blue Essence, even if it takes an impossibly long time to unlock all 160 plus of them. But the benefit is that players get champion shards upon leveling up, which is a token for a reduced cost champion and usually takes a few hours of play to acquire. I can hypothetically unlock DBD created killers and survivors using iridescent shards, which are earned every time a player levels up. So a killer costs 9,000 eerie shards. A game of DVD lasts maybe 15 minutes if we include load and queue times. Each player level nets around 300 eerie shards, meaning that I need 30 player levels for each individual killer or survivor. A game of DVD gets me maybe a third of a player level, and if I'm to really hedge the estimates here, that's around an hour of playtime per player level. Now multiply one hour by 30 levels, and it will take, ta-da, 
30 hours to get a singular character without paying for them, whose perks might be invalidated with the next balance patch. The killers and survivors that are locked behind licensing deals are outright required financial purchases. So if I were to buy all the licensed killers and survivors, those belonging to third-party IPs like Ghostface and Scream, it would cost me a total of $96 for those specific DLCs alone. This includes access to high presence perks such as Barbecue and Chili, Save the Best for Last, Lethal Pursuer, Deadlock, Ultimate Weapon, Decisive Strike, Plot Twist, Buckle Up, Reassurance, Blast Mine, and so on and so forth. Now keep in mind that DBD, on top of possessing over $200 worth of DLC over the last seven years, also has a robust cosmetic shop and a premium battle pass. <laughs> this is a game that one can easily easily spend over a thousand dollars on if they're not careful with it and in my mind with how behavior treats the gameplay side of things it's not worth it if anything behavior has realized that they can continue to push out content that's layers on top of itself because they'll charge a premium price for competitively required content in order to continue funding the development team rather than address the issues that lie at the game's core that is my overall issue with Dead by Daylight. I am thankful that the game has made some improvements over the years and gone on to address some of its largest issues. Around a year or so ago, there were some massive improvements made to the overall visual clarity of the title. And from what I've been able to work out, the audio has also massively improved compared to years ago. I remember back in the day, if you invited friends to play Survivor games with you, you would have to re-invite them after every single match. I remember vaults being exceptionally buggy and inconsistent. I remember the terrible hitboxes on every structure and survivor in the game. I had even less playtime five years ago than I do now, and I still remember these things and can objectively say that the game is in a better and clearer place. I'm a pretty big fan of the new prestige system, giving players an opportunity to show off their collection and dedication to the game with a fun shiny badge. It also streamlines the process of sharing perks with other characters by clearly stating that if you reach prestige three, everyone gets this perk at max level. Reaching Prestige 3 for any one character doesn't take that long, thankfully, and if the queue times are short and consistent enough, then grinding out one character goes by pretty quickly. After Prestige 3 is reached as well, there's incentive to use those newfound perks on characters that you might not have put points into. Now, killers are more widely affected by this than survivors, as I find that killers have perks that impact the game more. For example, I am currently trying to level my Meg so that I can get adrenaline on all the survivors I own, but I I don't feel like I'm doing more or less by not having access to made for this. But on the other hand, I really want to learn how to get good at Deathslinger, but I feel severely limited by not having Rabid Brutality. And that's because playing as a killer offers a very unique gameplay challenge. How good are you at using their power against the base mechanics of the game? Is the power that your killer possesses strong enough to cheat some of those mechanics? And how should one prepare for survivors that can play around it? To put it another way, playing survivor makes me feel like I made necessary preparations because because aside from different perk builds and maps that can slightly vary gameplay, they all play the same. Playing killer makes me feel smart for actually gaining mastery over a unique character, but both of these perspectives wouldn't be possible without having both sides of the coin, and I can appreciate how much more experienced survivors will make certain killers more difficult to play. The game mechanics that require both sides to complement each other's success or failure that very clearly shows off a deep understanding of an admittedly repetitive and simple gameplay loop is what has gotten me so interested in playing DBD again. It'll hold my interest for a little while longer off of those principles, and I wish I could explain it to you more than just a simple paragraph, but just know that if I stop playing Dead by Daylight shortly after this video goes up, you'll know exactly why. And that's all I wanted to say for this video. I'm sure if I dug deeper and wound up playing more of this game, I'd have a lot more to say. But sadly, my experience is pretty limited to what I remember from several years ago and comparing it to recent experiences. That is kind of the point with these videos where the commentary is more akin to what I would say if I were speaking naturally and if I were just getting into a game. But I will admit that there's a lot of depth to DVD and I currently lack the experience to vocalize that understanding in a more in-depth manner. Thanks for watching, safe travels, and goodbye.